We, I guess it doesn't matter. Go, begin, run. Right. Okay. See, load. By the way, I was um, looking at some stuff since uh, uh, hopefully John will see this, uh, John the Geek, that is. Um, I was looking for some stuff on some like DCE or something, and I ran into like one of his blogs and ended up oh. using it. So it's Very kind good. of serendipitous a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So this week, um, can you see my screen, first of all? Yes. Okay, good, good. Um, so we're obviously continuing on with causal inference, but um, whereas last week, I believe, was all about kind of experimental methods or like, you know, sort of, um, you know, sort of manipulation based sort of methods, you know, where, well, actually, I don't, yeah, I mean, I, I'm trying to think like, how do, how do we differentiate what we did last week from this week? I mean, this week is about um well here. last week i would say it was more about the randomized experiments right, right? Yes. and although he did touch on regression he kept tossing stuff off to this chapter uh for details so i guess right okay that's helpful yeah so um right so now by using regression um we can do stuff like as we'll get to later we can get stuff like um you know having covariates to, to control for to adjust for also, we can do things like interactions a, little, a lot easier. So, um, yeah, well, one of the interesting sentences in the beginning of the chapter I thought was, uh, he said, in the usual regression context, predictive inference um, relates to comparisons between units, whereas causal inference addresses comparison of different treatments if applied to the same units, right? So that's that is a great sentence. I should give that one. Isn't I should it? write that on a sticker and stick around my computer because that's that really phrases it very precisely. Yeah, and then, then the next is, is also really so more generally causal inference can be viewed as a special case of prediction in which the goal is to predict what would 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 have happened right in different treatment, which by the way is all about counterfactuals, which once again, if you um kind of tie it into last week, um, if you buy making things happen, which I actually I, I kind of glanced at a little bit, but I need to get back into this. Counterfactuals are a huge part of sort of causal explanation, right? right? So if only I hadn't, um, you know, gotten in my car, you know, and dri driven when I was mad, or you know, and gotten in an accident or something like that. And when anytime you can do this, I, I, I actually this uh, I have a friend who's a historian, like you know, his PhD in history, and if you think about it, I mean, like counterfactuals are a huge part of all you know you know imagine if you know hitler hadn't invaded you know russia or something. right you know what i mean it's like it's full of that and that and of course they can't really do anything to tease apart no <laughs> you can keep you can keep track in the back right like oh right i wasn't mad well why was i mad let's look at the cause of that well i wasn't yeah. mad because this if only i hadn't you know i don't yeah. know if only whatever made, whatever made you mad right if only right. i hadn't opened up twitter and right. seen that you know, tweet. Well, what made me open up Twitter? Well, you just keep going back, right? right. I wouldn't have opened Twitter if only you know I was the T. The I don't know. My yeah. TV show is over, and I didn't go to the gym. I should have gone to the gym. If only I'd gone to the gym or something. You know, yeah. Yeah. Right? Well, and it's not even just about going back into the causal chain. It's also just about the fact that, like, when you know, we look at history. I mean, we we can only imagine the alternative worlds. We can't really do right. anything yeah. to sort of like to see if it works or not. I mean, so there is like this sort of limitation. We can at least use you know sort of analytics to kind of come up with True. some ideas about those, like you know what's 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 causally going on. Those yeah. causal chains are interesting, though, right? Because you don't yeah. like, like World War. You you mentioned Hitler, but that's an interesting one to, to trace back. Right into World War One and why did World War One start? Like you, you just keep going back into all oh, yeah. kinds of weird, strange things happening in Austria, and you know, it's just like <laughs> oh, I mean, and, and then, yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean, like if you think about it, like World War Two, like at least in most people's mind, makes sense causally. Like you know, okay, Hitler invaded Poland, he did this, that, and the other thing, and you know, then the Pearl Harbor happened, and but for like you know, you ask the average American, you know, which is sort of a sad state of affairs, yeah. but. You know what's the causal structure of why World War II happened? Well, okay, or World War One happened. Excuse me. Well, you know, it's like there was this assassination, but if you really look at it, that's that was only a really you know there was people that was just a spark that 
that was a spark argue, right yeah, yeah. So you could actually argue that wasn't the causal thing it was just the no. last sort of like it could have been anything it could have been anything there maybe, was sparks but, everywhere that was the one that yeah, yeah 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 yeah, yeah, Germany talked about like invading countries in like 1895. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they had been thinking about war and, and as, well, as they, I mean, we don't want to spend all day on this, but you know, I, I, we both probably read the same books about World War One, but it's yeah. fascinating because, like, yeah, Germany was like just they had this big giant military, they just wanted to use it, <laughs> right? Right, exactly. Yeah, so, so it's like, so, so that, yeah, that, that's that, that, that's in and of itself is a causal sort of yeah. thing, you know, it's like. Hey, you know, it's like hard to leave a tool like that, old, you know, alone, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, anyway, okay. so, very yeah. interesting stuff. They, I'm look, I got to look at that book. I'm going to put that. I did put yeah. that on my list. I'm going to grab it. I think we might get credit for the, being the first using World War One and Two uh, examples. And <laughs> I think we might we might get we might get some credit for that one. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so what's what's new this week as opposed to last week is this idea of using regression. To get more control for adjustment, so for things like you know adjusting for pre-treatment predictors or interactions, right, or other things that we might want to control for, so that we can have a clear sort of interpretation. So there's three kinds of measurements. You know, it's not really that surprising. So pre-treatment measurements, which are covariate. So like, if, let's say we're doing something on, you know, giving asthmatic patients, you know, uh, you know, some kind of an intervention to see if it improves well, you know, like things like body weight and BMI and, um, you know, where the people live and, uh, you know, like, is it industrial or suburban or rural or whatever. And so those are all things that you would want to have as covariates, right? One of the things he also says later, I don't talk about it much, so I'll just say now is, you know, don't include any kind of post-treatment measurements. Um, because of course, those are all things that causally are after you know the intervention, and so um, you know it's not necessarily great to try to like include those things too, because that's going to kind of muddy the waters in terms right. of you know what the actual you know the the, the chain of causation is. So yeah, um, so this is something like even there's a lot of people like in clinical trials who say even if you have you know you do all of your sort of sampling and everything correct you still want to have covariates adjusted for you know because they, they just may not be in balance between the two groups the treatment and the control group um also we can do things like subpopulations which um I'll, I'll i'll touch on so covariates you know these are things that are not sort of the primary outcome or the primary treatments right these are just things that we think are related one of the things that's hard about doing using these sort of pretreatment measures these covariates is, is when you do these models, you're sort of assuming that you have all of the variables that you would need to do a, a you know an admirable job of these you know covariates um, you know adjustments, right? And so one of the things that may be the case is there may be things that you just don't have, right? Uh, which is a common concern, especially amongst like observational research. But even in like a clinical trial, you know, maybe there's some covariate that you wish you know at the eleventh hour that you had measured, um, but you just don't have it. Uh, so that yeah, these are yeah that that's one. So yeah. in an observational study, which is not discussed here much, but you right, know, right, right, right. Yeah. So I just asked a question: Isn't everything post treatment? I guess I guess we knew some things were measured, but even the um, necessarily. I mean, you could have longitudinal data, right? And so one of the things okay. that like that's um, like I've done studies where we go, okay, we want to look at like. Um, Use we had like this one like uh, uh, migraine treatment intervention thing, and so you know um, we looked at a bunch of stuff like what people were doing before they showed up for this migraine clinic. You know what I mean? Like what were the things okay. that they had before, and we used that as like you know predictors. What were what were things that were predictive of like having more success? You know, with this this treatment, right? Um, so th some of those were like actual predictors, but then there's just other things that we wanted to control for related to migraines right like I don't know there was a bunch of stuff um but yeah for sure you you um uh if if you only have contemporaneous data or cross-sectional data yeah then it's all kind of moot but yeah you, usually observational data is I mean especially like in like a hospital setting is implicitly longitudinal right because you have people you know filling out questionnaires filling out measures at different time points, not at the same time point, right? Like, some, and and people can just ignore those requests to fill out those things. But yeah, you can. It, it definitely has. It's you know, 
usage where like you can get a lot of really nice data that is longitudinal, just not sort of balanced. Uh, so the treatment uh, and the outcome, so the, you know, the, the independent variable and the dependent variable are obviously the other parts of the equation. And that's all we're going to kind of talk about. As you mentioned last week, I'm returning to my favorite example of the electric company, which was like a more grown up version of Sesame Street, I think. And so, yeah, they're they're looking at people's or uh, children's, you know, consumption or, you know, or, or being in the control group for, for the electric company and how children's reading abilities change as a function of being exposed to this. So we have um, classes of children in, in grades one through four, and they were randomized as in, in at classroom at, at the classroom level. So these are like cluster randomized, not individual randomized. Um, so they were randomized into treated and, and control groups. Beginning of the year, uh, kids did the reading test and they did it at the end of the year. Um, right, I believe that's what that's one of the things we said. And, yeah, and so we don't really have individual student data. So this is like, we could have a more nested data set, which is students nested within classrooms, right? And classrooms nested within schools or right. whatever. We're only focused on the classroom level. We're only looking at the average sort of classroom, which, you know, has its own set of problems, but, you know, there you go. Uh, so this whole thing, um, the, the, this design that I've just described is an example of a match pairs design. Um, so, yeah, the... Um, and right, he said in the book that ideally you analyze it that way, but it requires this multi-level approach that he's saving for the mystical book two. Right, oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah, this was, I like this, 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 this was the um, <clears throat> cool thing that was made in the book where you, you, you create the line, the vertical line shows the average for um, corresponding group of classrooms. And so, yeah, we can kind of see here um, that for, well, these are controls and then these are treated, right? So what's the pattern? We, we definitely see, um, that uh, watching the experiment may have uh, led to small increases in average test scores, particularly for lower grades, right? So for, um, you look at, we have grade one, two, three, four, from left to right. Yeah, we're, we're definitely seeing kind of more stuff on the, you know, the right of these lines for um, the earlier sort of um, years, so to speak. So um, yeah, like they said, uh, uh, there's an apparent ceiling with respect to the reading assignment used that there is not much room for improvement. So yeah, this is another problem with just um, in measurement, right? We have ceiling effects. So, you know, it just may be that the the reading assessment that we have is just not that is not, um, you know, robust enough to really to, to really tease apart differences. So it, it sounds like we have a lot of people kind of tapping out at the, at the upper levels. Um, and yeah. that's maybe a sort of a, a limit. So, um, yeah, so when we're doing this paired comparison design, when we talk about, you know, uh, when treatments are assigned completely at random, we can think of, you know, these as two separate groups. Uh, they're two random samples from a common population because the only thing that's different in them is whether or not they got the treatment, which in this case is getting to watch, um, uh, I was going to say Sesame Street, the electric company. Uh, so the population average difference between treatment and control is just, you know, subtracting the, the um, the information from the control group from the uh, treatment group. So um, this is a simple sort of unadjusted model where we're just looking at treatment, predicting post-test. We're not even controlling for like the pre-test. Uh-oh, sorry, I gotta, forgot to run the stuff above. Oh. <laughs> this takes a second. Um, uh oh, what, what's, what's going on here? Now, all of a sudden, this is what? What is plot? This might be something where, like, I might, I don't, I don't know, like, I might have what? Electric not found. Hey, right, hold on a second. Let me guess. Yeah, I, I that you, just loads the file. You still have to like, there's a line below where you did some processing, right? Yeah, yeah, but I guess I thought I, 
we have this all together. This ran earlier, but of course, you know, that's 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 the nature of it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. All right, let's see how this works. Um, so you did something up there, like if you just went by it where you define electric from electric wide or something like that. You did some. Yeah. So there. sorry. Yeah. So this in the okay. Yeah. So what basically the um, the on the website the um, whoever did the code they they created two versions of it. One is a wide version. So electric wide is uh, okay is yeah this and then the that's deal. for plotting i mean sometimes it pays yeah 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 for, plotting. for sure for GG yeah so it, that, that's it so i was just using that i use pivot wider pivot longer almost 99 percent of my uses are for plotting <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah no, for sure yeah pivot pivot wider put it longer huge um i totally agree um okay yeah so when we just look at treatment predicting post tests we're not controlling for anything we're saying, I guess, actually, how would you interpret this? So, so like, okay, so this are, these are like points. Me, the median increase in points is for the people getting the treatment is yeah. um, five point six points, right? So, I guess if you know they had, they were, and so for the controls, we're saying the controls should have a average score of ninety four point three. Does that sound right? And so um, for grade, what grade is that for? Oh, you're not going to This, is, this is everybody. We've yeah. collapsed across grades. So, yeah, we're going to come back to that and do. So yeah. So, the average, I guess that's what that means, right? The untreated right. group the controls had a score of 94.3, and the treated groups had average 5.6 higher, right? Yeah. So, anyway, yeah, this, this is a fairly large number, but it's also one that is fairly, um, it's, you know we haven't really controlled for much we haven't done much so it's hard to take too much serious so right. this code here will do well by the way i still haven't done your i i meant to i have your code thing that i need to work on i didn't get to it this week but I'll oh yeah it. no worries um so now what we're doing is, is and this <laughs> is a cool use of map by the way so this you know <laughs> advanced wow, argument. yeah what so this, <laughs> yeah this is a cool thing so we have we're basically saying hey um that's cool yeah map this whole thing onto you know, one through four, because that's the, the grades and um, yeah. Nice. Yeah. I need to get used to use, I mean, it's funny, I spent, I use map and a plot and reduce and everything else in, in like uh, Python and uh, even in C++ using the functional stuff yeah. there. And for some reason in R, I just not in the habit of like using, grabbing the per stuff as much as I should be. Yeah, I uh, will believe me, I've used it a lot. And like, it's like, but you know, it, it's a big production for me to, to use it successfully. <laughs> and so and then it's like, I don't, and I don't come back to it enough. And so yeah. one of the things I'm trying to do is like, you know, this whole idea of, you know, you do it once, it's fine, do it twice, but, you know, write a function, you know, do it three times. Yeah, I'm right. trying, I'm, I don't know, that I'm going to get to a, I'm trying to write a package, but I'm trying to write more functions and, and use them instead of, you know, repeating or copying and pasting things. I think that's really importance i mean really a part of the problem and this is on me too but i would say a little bit it's on ours fault because just the way r works they, they have to have all these different map dfr map chr yeah. because the typing is so weak you have to actually tell it what kind of type rather than just confuse yeah it well, because, yeah it can be map logical or map, yeah. or map whether is it where like another language is just one map function it just figures out from the type of the result what it should do right yeah but, so or in Python, uh -huh. where it doesn't carry as long one type. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so I think yeah, actually one of these is okay. Oh, nice. Yeah. So um, okay, right. So this is now we this plot FX is actually you know what I should have done first. I just realized is um, let's look at this one first. And then actually, maybe we'll see if it even works. Hold on, we'll just, I, I don't know what, oh, wait a minute. Fits, sorry, not fits. Um, I do that kind of thing all the time. I've I, I, I changed my naming convention halfway through. <laughs> no, 
No. I'm really bad too. Like sometimes I have an underscore fit, fit zero, other fit underscore one. I'm like, wait a minute, that's very inconsistent. <laughs> okay, yeah, you know what? Okay, I think I I realized it's really something. Obviously, we can't do this with the unadjusted with the unstratified. Yeah, one. it's it's back. It's expected. Yeah, sorry, I I just totally like was not. I was totally spaced out there. Um, okay, so yeah, we'll come back to this. And so, um, fits one my beer fits. Yes, now it's fits, of course. Oh, um, yeah, of course. Um, okay, so yeah, I mean, I think the big take, so this is now, we're, we're using the treatment indicator as the only predictor, but we've also stratified, we've also run these models um, at the class uh, level individually. Um, and so, but you can see here is, you know, obviously for grade one, you know, it's about this. They're they're improving just about as much as the grade two people, or the effect is of the same. But look at the the width of this um, confidence interval or uncertainty interval. Excuse me. Um, it's obviously pretty wide for the first graders, and so yeah, that's that's sort of a concern, right? Um, it's it's really hard to 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 really know what to take from this because um, you know of the of the variability here. So one of the things that we can do to improve this whole story is remember the only thing we've done so far is look at treatment right. as a predictor, but now by including the um, each individual person's pretest, so this is before they got the intervention or, or, or the control, and um, that's that's the only thing that's different. So basically, what we're doing is we're adjusting for how, and this is really important by the way because imagine you know. Um, you know, if, if someone has an early high score to begin with, I mean, you have the potential for regression to the mean, you know, um, and at the pretest, I'm saying, you know, you could have regression right. to the mean at post, um, or, you know, there's just a bunch of other things that could happen in terms of, you know, just having a sense of where they started from. It's it's an important sort of, you know, kind of developmental insight. So um, we're doing the same thing here when this fits two now, we're saying, Go through each grade, map this function, but the, the only thing that's different now is um, the addition of the pretest. So we should get hopefully something nice to look at. Um, oh yeah, so I like this. This was the um, pre and post test. Um, obviously, <laughs> the slope for the first graders is, is kind of intense. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, but. Uh, and then, you know, obviously for the other ones, it doesn't look too different. One of the things that we're also looking for, because eventually we're going to, well, actually we, we, we shouldn't see it because we're not fitting for it. But one of the things you want to notice, these lines are parallel, which means they're like main effects kind of models, like where we're just looking at, we're just modeling, you know, for two different groups, um, you know, treatment and control, you know, what's the change. Um, so what happens if we put an interaction term for, for on treatment, we'll see what happens um, eventually. So um, yeah, so the lines for the treated groups in all cases are higher on the graph than the control, um, but that's, you know, as to whether that's meaningful or not, that's kind of difficult. Um, yeah, so now for this, remember we did this plot effects yeah. thing before, for, so this is so okay. I'm gonna try. Actually, I meant to. I didn't get to this, but one of the things I meant to do was put a. Um, um, actually, no, that's the wrong. That's the wrong thing. I just did. Sorry. Um, I was gonna to try to put these uh, these plots so you could see them. So obviously, this is really really wide at grade one, and then you know it kind of gets a lot better at two, and then the the, the variance kind of cleans up a little bit in three and four. So now what happens, well, this is a lot narrower, right? So just the act of adding these, these um, pretest reading scores makes a huge difference just in terms of the variability, right? So um, especially once we get past the first grade. Um, so yeah, so uh, there you go. So now um, what's, what is next? Okay, yeah, so now we're gonna even go a little bit deeper and say, okay, we've already adjusted for the pretest score and obviously the effective treatment, but now let's do an interaction between, um, you know, interaction between pretest and uh, treatment. So 
uh, I don't know if we, we talked about interactions. Um, what would, what would we hypothesize the, the interaction to be, or should there be an interaction between like what one's pretest uh, score was and You're whether kidding. they got the treatment or the control? No, there shouldn't be. That's not the it shouldn't question. Shouldn't be. Right, right, exactly. But it may be that one of the groups has, um, you know, it's just a lot, you know, more, you know, uh, more variability in the pretest scores. Okay. So, um, okay. So that's what you're hoping to capture here. Cause you have, yeah, like you said, you shouldn't expect that there have been any per on purpose, but there could have been an accidental bias, right? An accidental mis, mis, um, imbalance. That's what you call it, right? Right. That you, that's the other thing you kind of correct for your accidental imbalance that. Yeah. Lower... I, mean, I, I guess you could also say this, that like, um, here's, here's another way of thinking. Oh, another way. It. Well, you, we're going to say another way of thinking was maybe people with lower pretests, the treatment is more effective on them. That's right. Exactly. So maybe so what, what we could say is, is um, maybe what we're, the, the, what the interaction is kind of querying is to say, Hey, um, is there any kind of, you know, does, does the effect of the treatment, does it vary? Is it moderated by how good you're yeah. reading before you, you know, even started this whole thing. Right. So the idea is, is um, if there is an interaction and it's, I guess I don't actually know what the directionality would be, but it would be probably we would hypothesize it to be something like this, where we say, "Hey, um, you know, we're expecting there to be um, something where uh, kids who have higher pretest scores and are in the treatment group get the most benefits, right?" Or actually, that's probably or the other way around. I would think the other way around, right? Exactly. Sorry. The kids are already doing well. It's not going to yeah. really help them that much. Yeah, right? exactly. So that that might be the case. So it might actually be just because of like this whole like ceiling effect that we kind of made reference. Yeah, to, right. The ceiling right? effect. So yeah. Um, now, one of the things we should see here is is um, see how the lines are kind of squiggly or they're kind of all cattywampus. Yeah. So um, because we're now we're now including this now, it looks like for the case of second grade, those are pretty parallel. But we see like. This isn't a huge sort of no. deviation, but it's clear that if we continued this, the, the 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 blue and the salmon line would overlap, and you know, at some point up up above. And for grade four, this is it's probably the noise. Big. Yeah. So now, um, yeah. So I mean, what, are the, what are the what are the what are the uh, coefficients on that? Oh, uh, yeah. I'm about to get to. Okay. Sorry. I suspect it. And just, yeah, yeah it's, uh, well, okay, here we go. So remember the, when it was nothing, when we were doing, oh, wait a minute. So, oh, this is fits one, actually, sorry, my bad. Um, right, but you want that for comparison, so that's good. Yeah, so then fits two is, okay, yeah, it's within, including the, so now we've gone from the treatment effects being three point seven. seven. Actually, hold on a second, wait a minute. Um, wasn't it wasn't that wasn't that 5.7 up above that was the that was when you had no um wait a minute yeah oh. oh you know what it was is oh, that was before we did the, the did we stratified by classroom right that's what it was. yeah sorry my bad i got it so this is which classroom this is first grade what's that we're looking at first grade here Oh yeah, right, right. So no, like so just so just to be clear, sorry, let me go up to the top here and kind of just walk you through this one more time. Um so basically for the first model, all we're doing is saying across we're we're collapsing across all grades and we're saying just look at the effects of treatment on the post test school, right? And and then that that's fits that's fit underscore zero, right? That's that's the that's the base. Oh uh, that so there is a meaning for the S. Because one's a yes. list. Now I yes, get yes, yeah, fits. I didn't think about that. Yeah, obviously I just cribbed all this code. So yeah, mm -hmm. I'm feeling pretty, pretty sheepish about <laughs> not understanding this. But yeah, so the idea is, is that we're running these for each classroom separately and then aggregating after the fact, right? And so this, the, the idea being we're getting a more nuanced or a better assessment of the effects of treatment because we're doing it you know, at, at the classroom level. Okay, so yeah, that's that's what fits one means. And then fits two is, um, okay, almost there. Okay, so fits one is just, you know, uh, this is the stratified thing. So we go from 5.7, I believe when it's unstratified 
right um, to 3.7 so that that makes sense so we're like, we're, what we can say is is it's a pretty that's a pretty big you know that's a two you know two out of 5.7 that's like that's that's quite a lot of um information or that's but a, which that's, which one of these which one of the fits is this you're looking at sorry sorry yes yeah, so well this is fits one so this is the stratified no, but it's fourth class. four means fourth grade is that what that means no, it just means this is just the fourth piece of the little the list. Yeah, so the list is like grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four, right? Oh, um, I don't, let me see. I don't know. Yeah, once again, I, I'm, I'm using- I'm pretty sure that means it's grade four. I think that they did them in order, right? One, two, three, four, grade one, two, three, four, this see. is grade four. Let's see if this works. That'd be grade one. So grade one, as we thought, we has a much bigger effect, right? Because there, there's no ceiling. Right. Although, you know, I don't know if it's significant enough. It looks like, in my eye, it looks bigger. Significantly okay. bigger. Right. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Sorry, this is my bad. Oh, yeah, it's right there at 12. It says grade four. Let's yeah. look at three miles for grade four. That's what they're doing. Okay, so that's fine. So then grade two. I, wanna, I think grade four is interesting to look at because that's one that seemed to have a big uh, interaction, but I bet you that interaction is not significant. Yeah, probably not. Um, okay, yeah. Sorry, I didn't even notice the um, the, the double subset. Um, okay, so now this is so fits one is is stratified, and um, fits two is stratified plus the pretest. So let me just right. do this. Let me actually. Well, I guess I have to like. Let's look up grade four like they're doing. That's fine. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Because I'm curious about that one. Okay, so, so this is one point two. Let me go back up and rerun run and just yeah, to show make this. that one four as well. Yeah. Um, so, so we go from 3.7 oh, okay. to, yeah, it's quite a bit, that's quite a bit fall. Yeah. So the, but it's so narrower, it's also narrower too, the uncertainty in it. So that's, you, yeah. you know, these, they're probably statistically significant, uh, consistent with each other. Like I mentioned the 1.7 is within one sigma of the other one, but now that's narrower, better, uh, more uh, uncertain outcome or uncertain estimate. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, basically what this tells us is, is that well, a lot of the stuff that we thought was a treatment effect was really just how good they were reading. Yeah. Or not prior to the, you know, the study. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then this last one is that this is one of the, with the interaction, right? And this is only fourth graders, right? So, yeah, I see the inter interaction. It looks big, but it's not, it's not kind of random. Yeah. The, um, Which you expect is at the end, all the it's all the data is at the top end so those two lines yeah. you know they diverge it's like they got a lot of yeah. leverage or what do you want to say the pivot points right there amongst all the data yeah and i guess you know the only thing that's kind of tricky now is and and we uh, we kind of talked about this i think in a previous week which is when you know once you include an interaction the main effects sort of become uninterpretable you know i think or at least you know it's hard sure it does you'd have to look at what the average pretest was yeah. to get at least some idea which he does do i think in the book right so whatever the average pretest, you'd have to then combine that with the treatment effect. Right. Hopefully get back to, in fact, I think he goes through the, the exercise in the book and you get back to where you were. Yeah. Oh, it's in there. Yeah, keep going. Actually, well, yeah, actually, this is this is the end. I, this is as far as I got, sorry. Um, oh, well, so, in the next part, it, it would then combine together the average pretest score uh, with that treatment. You get back the same answer you have from the previous, which is right. basically it's, it's, mathematically equivalent. Yeah. Well, so yeah, so basically, um, just to, just to be clear, I, I know there was other stuff. Um, so we're not that bad on time. I, I guess I was my attitude was like I didn't, you know, I think there was stuff about. Um, hold on, let me pull up the book here. Yeah, I forget. I forget myself. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, basically. Hold on a second. Am I... Yeah, so basically this is the majority of everything that happened in the book. Um, oh, yeah, they did talk about like gain scores and stuff like that, which, you know, I guess we kind of touch on. Yeah, so I just got basically to, you know, talking about interactions and then, yeah, I didn't... Um, yeah, I didn't do post stratification of conditional treatment and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, this was this last part was oh yeah, and then also I already talked about this. Don't adjust for right. post variable. So yeah, that was like the last thing I 
well, I guess I don't know. There's other stuff. That that whole section, yeah, yeah, that whole section about intermediate effects was kind of like longer than it needed to be, by the way. But well, yeah, actually, so uh, this section is something I'm actually doing a mediation analysis right now, and oh. so I meant to like actually put something in. I ran out of time today, but yeah, mediation. Have you done anything with mediation or moderation before? No. Yeah. No. So like mediation basically just means there's there's a, a variable that's in the middle of some kind of causal or you know, potentially causal relationship, right? So um, I'm trying to think, like um, there's I want to I want to I want to use like a decent example so I don't like you know kill myself here trying to like explain this, but yeah. So basically, imagine we have. Um, How about this? Like, there's, so there's a variable in um, there's a, there's a construct in psychology called need for cognition, right? So um, there are some people that love to do puzzles and games and things like that, and we're pro we're probably both, you know, most I would say analysts are probably pretty high on it. Oh yeah, 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 right. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that was a thing. That's cool. Oh yeah, need it's called for need for cognition. cognition. University of Chicago. This guy named John Cassiopo kind of discovered. That's what my whole problem is my whole life now. And now I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have an unusual there. need for yeah. cognition. <laughs> right, and so imagine like we create some intervention to improve people's like reasoning abilities. Right, that's that's actually a thing. Right, there are these interventions that people have created to kind of like you know improve people's reasoning abilities. Yes. Right. And so you would think, okay, so there's we have we have treatment groups that get the 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 reasoning intervention and the control group that doesn't. Right. But then you might say, hey, um, what about for those you know that's you know the, the you know for the, have a high need for cognitive cognition that might they may they may be more likely to improve than those that don't right because you know this the idea of need for cognition of course. Is you, yeah. you love doing this stuff for the sake of it you know it also could be the opposite right the people that need for cognition are already are doing good reasoning and so anyway the point is is we we would argue that need for cognition is like a me, the mediator it it is a potentially like a causal sort of window into the relationship between right. between you know the intervention and the outcome right and um you know there could be multiple ones we're not saying that the entire relationship between the, the the treatment and the outcome are completely mediated we're just saying that at least some of the effect of the the treatment is um goes through this idea of need for cognition right so and then uh, i don't know if they talk about it here but then the other kind of piece would be what's called moderation right so a moderator variable so a moderator is just like for whom does some relationship hold, right? Um, there's a famous example in depression uh, stuff, right? Um, so uh, gender is a moderator in the relationship between rumination and depression, right? So for females, there's a pretty strong positive relationship between how ruminative you are, which means you just kind of think about bad stuff that happened over and over again, you know? And, um, but for men, that, that relationship oft, often doesn't exist. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so gender is a moderator, right? For um, the relationship between, you know, um, you know, like this, this rumination and this, this outcome. So I don't know if that makes sense, but those yeah, are like the, the two most popular things. So anyway, uh, I wanted to leave. So you said you did 19.3. And yes, 198. So I can run through those real quick. Let me, um, let me stop share. Yeah, go ahead. Hit it up. Yeah, I left just enough time. So, so 19.3 is relatively straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, it's just the question of, you know, when they're doing the, the uh, outcome, there's this, this thing called gain score, right? Instead of looking at the, you know, instead of looking at the final test, only you can look at the final test divided by the pretest. I might it's not divided by, but subtracted from the pretest. How much gain was there from the pretest to the final exam, right? That's a gain, right? Or anything where you measure something ahead of time, then you have some kind of intervention. Later, you have some kind of measurement of that same variable again. And you're like, how much gain was there in that variable? Um, and mm. the question was, if you do like a gain score model, he said, we noted that if we include the pretreatment measure as uh, in your model, right, as a covariate, 
then the COVID co coefficient on that treatment indicator will not will be the same as if you just use the standard regression, didn't use the, the, the gain. Mm -hmm. And really, it's just an algebraic thing, right? Um, right? Because the if you run a regression on the on the, the ordinary model, right? You have some mm -hmm. kind of outcome intercept. This is the thing tile that we care about, right? And Z is whether you got the treatment or not. And uh, X mu here is the X u is the uh, covariate, right? The, right right yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. so if we instead do the gain which is just y minus x but then also still go ahead and add in i'm sorry x x again right as a mm -hmm. covariate you just do the algebra to move things around you have exactly the same equation except instead of gamma you have gamma prime minus one so clearly tau prime and tau have to be the same so mm -hmm. you get the same uh estimate of the effect of the treatment it doesn't matter whether you include the uh, whether you do it as a function of gain or you do it as a function of outcome, as long as you've included the pretreatment uh, variable in your regression. So that was pretty straightforward. Yeah. Although in some ways, maybe not obvious if you just, you know, if somebody's asked you that, you go, well, no, wait a minute, let me think about it. But if you get it down a piece of paper, <laughs> one of those things, get a piece of paper, it's pretty obvious what's going on. Yeah, the only thing I would just say is, is I don't know um, if you've ever kind of run into this, but there's a lot of like bad um, kind of, like concerned about using basically what are these are changed they're, we're calling them gain scores but they're they're change scores right so well he um, called them gain scores but yeah change would be a good better yeah place. um yeah i mean i guess the only thing i just you know there, there is some people that would say don't use change although i guess if you are like including the pretest score that definitely will anchor it because obviously yeah like if you just look at the raw change or the gain score or whatever you want to call it you know right he makes that point like looking at that by itself is probably a mistake right <laughs> right because like you could go from like let's say like you know this is a zero to a hundred percentage point test yeah. you could have someone who gets goes from being like basically like a 10 to a um a 25 so that's 15 right yeah. but then you could have somebody who's you know a 60 goes at 75 there's a, those are two different scenarios yeah all right so I, that's that's that thing um uh yeah, and in fact, in the case of the uh, the student thing, if you did just do the gain and didn't include the pretreatment, you get bad answers because remember, in the first graders only got a partial piece of the test; they couldn't get a score higher than twenty five. <laughs> right, so they, all, they would all have huge gains. <laughs> right, so you better control for that. Um, anyway, so uh, so this next one, the problem was. Um, <laughs> There is an agricultural experiment that's conducted on 50 cows. And the, the, the goal here was to uh, estimate the effect of a feed additive. Uh, mm -hmm. and it had six different outcomes in there, um, all related to the different milk fat produced by each cow. Mm -hmm. uh, so they have four different diets corresponding to different levels of the additive. It was like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0.3. And three variables were recorded, pretreatment variables recorded. Uh, how many seasons of lactation the cow had, how old the cow was, and the initial weight of the cow, right? Maybe. There's also post treatment variables we're gonna ignore, of course. Um, the cows uh, were initially assigned to treatments completely at random, so that was fine. But then these guys decided to go back when they looked at the distributions within each of their, within the treatment and the control groups, they looked at the distribution of the covariates and decided to move some cows around at random, some, some kind of randomization method was tried to try to balance them better. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> So that's why he calls it messy randomization because this probably was no, there's no yeah. way you can really do that that doesn't uh, cause some kind of dependence on the uh, pretreatment variables right on the on the potential outcomes on the on the uh, treatment variable right right so you've, you've introduced some kind of accidental dependence there by trying to fix things with your randomization um, that's what I got out of that right so they tried to balance yeah. the covariance um, see. Now, he's to assume that the treatment depends only on the fully observed covariates and not on some unrecorded variables, such as the physical appearance of the cows or something else. So that's what we're supposed to assume, I presume, right? right. Uh, and we have to assume that because the decisions of whether to be randomized was not explained. <laughs> so mm -hmm. we don't know why they did that. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have. In any event, uh, we'll consider three different estimates of the effect of the additive on the mean dairy milk fat. So uh, I'm going to read the CSV in, and of course there's something wrong. What's wrong here? Oh, I'm not. Open, I didn't open the project. I wish you get to do that. Oh yeah, projects are key, man. Where am I, I mean, like here? just in terms of getting stuff. Maybe in the right directory.
course, I have to reevaluate, I believe. Which is not hard because we just did that. Okay, so now we can get the cow out, the cows, load them in. <laughs> All right, so I have to do a quick calculation because the um, in the data, there's, well, here. In the data, here's the level, right? 0, 0.1.2.3, lactation over years, the age, the initial weight. Then there's this dry milk, and then the, the uh, whatever mm. that means. The, okay, so the milk uh, weight, the this fat is the percentage of the milk that's that's milk fat. So to get the milk fat, you have to multiply these two together. That's in the right. notes. It's in the notes for the um, the what do you call it? the code book? It's in the code book. Here it is. Right. Yeah. Right. Imagine if you did this kind of work for a living, <laughs> like cow age and like you know <laughs> solid fats. I mean, I don't know. I think it'd be I, fun. I'm, not, I'm not being. I, I'm being. I'm being quite serious. I mean, it's like every time like I I, I see some new domain, it's always like, man, it's always crazy to me that like. You know the, the stuff people look at it's just like it's it's yeah cool. i mean i think it's really i think it'd be fun if anybody's watching yeah. there's somebody to analyze their cows i'm available yeah, i mean dude I'm <laughs> into it, but are we nesting cows within farms and then like farms within like regions because you know you, you probably have to yeah they're not doing that here but you probably have to it's kind of interesting well, i mean you probably what's, funny, what's actually like... funny to me about it is i'm sure that if you do it for a long time you just start saying cows and milk fat and you they're just numbers to you. You probably don't even think about what you're doing anymore. Yeah. Right? But no, but I was thinking like maybe there's like, you know, like there's like geographical effects or something. I mean, you know, where you live, you know, might have a, you know, I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing cow and milk solid um, uh, <laughs> speculation. Yeah. So first part A tells us to uh, do a simple regression on the mean dairy milk fat on the level of additives. So that's pretty straightforward. We'll just do a level regression on level. Um, we find that the effect of the per per full decimal point, a per it's a per point. I'm uh, sorry, sorry, for each one of addition, the milk fat is increased by 1.2. Keep in mind that nothing, no one was ever given a full unit. Mm -hmm. It's either 0 0.1, 0 0.2, or 0 0.3. So you got to divide that by 10 to imagine the kind of actual effects that are happening here. Right. Um, and you know, it's got a pretty big error bar. It, but this is completely uninterpretable, I think, because um, the re-randomization, like I said, depended on the three covariates. So the outcome, the potential outcomes probably depends on, uh, probably not independent of the treatment, right? Because the outcome obviously depends on these variables, the age of the cat, a uh, cat, age of the cow. Oh God, milk, milking yeah, cats. Yeah, Nobody wants to do yeah. that. <laughs> it changes all the cats. The milking the cats. That anyway. <laughs> Uh, so the point of this is, I would say the potential outcomes are not independent of the treatment here um, for the full set. So you have to do conditional on the covariates, right? Unconditionally, they're not independent of the treatment. I think that's pretty clear during the messy randomization. Does that make sense? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Is that a B, B minus answer? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So it's, um, yeah. Sorry, I'm looking at your screen. I know oh. it's, it's hard to tell what I'm doing because my camera's over here, but- I do the same thing. If I'm looking I look at, at, I look I at two monitors. All, I, I put all of the stuff I'm reading on the other screen. So. Well, so to say it a different way, right? We know that the outcome most likely depends on these covariates. That's why we chose them, right? These mm -hmm. variables. And so since we did this randomization based on those covariates, right? Then the, out, the potential outcomes aren't independent of the treatment anymore. And that's required for that analysis that we did above to be valid, right? We'd have to have total randomization. We don't have total randomization anymore, or we have, we do have conditional randomization still, right? Because they're only organized according to the covariates. So that part we can still rely on. And so that's why in part B, I chose to add all of them because apparently all of them are used to determine which groups they would add, end up in. And so we're gonna you add all the covariates. I didn't add any interactions though. Um, and I, to be honest, I never am sure about when you should, when you should add interactions between these things, but I can't, I, I could imagine maybe like kind of some kind of age lactation interaction, but yeah. I didn't do any kind of interactions on this. It's already enough, enough, enough uh, parameters. I felt like that's a bad excuse, but yeah. uh, so controlling for all those things, we get a, a level effect of 1.3 with a smaller standard age 0.5. What was it before? Before it was 1.2. So it's actually... I guess the randomization didn't mess things up too badly. It's consistent yeah. with that result, right? That's what I got out of that. 
Uh, again, I don't know whether it's appropriate to try to add some interactions here. I don't know. I'm never sure about that. I, guess, I mean, if you have time, then what you do is just try adding them and see what happens. Right. right. <laughs> I didn't want to, I didn't have time, so I didn't start adding. No, that's them. fine. Because um, it might matter that, oh, the older ones, it matters maybe if they're lactating, how many lactate, but probably the age and lactation is probably correlated, anyways. Lact lactation remember is the number of seasons of lactation. I didn't look at the correlation there, but. Hmm. In part C, they say, okay, turn the uh, level now into a, a fact. Since there's only three different levels, well, four if you count nothing, right? So 0 0.1, 0.2, 0 0.3, the only levels. Let's try that as a fact. Let's turn that into a factor and refit it. So mm -hmm. then we end up with this. So now we end up with a different. Now this is different. Oh, you have to interpret this differently, right? So um, if you got 0.1 of the treatment, then it had this effect, right? If you had 0.3, you'd have this effect, 0.4 increase in milk fats, right? Yeah. And so this, um, what was I talking about? Oh, okay. Anyway, hello. Let's make some plots. So I made this crazy plot here, <laughs> which needs some labels. So I'm just going to. It is crazy. Them. I mean, I love the crazy. It's pretty dope. <laughs> so the black uh, points and the black error bars are for the factor model, right? So this is the effect from point one with its standard deviation effect from point two, this standard deviation effect from point through that standard deviation. The red lines are just draws from the um, slopes from the original first model we did, sorry, the second model we did, right? Um, so this is where we fit it as a slope, right? And so that's why there all these lines are like, there's multiple samples from the, well, let me just show you where it is in here, right? So mm -hmm. I just did, took fit two and took all the draws of it um, and then um, drew lines somewhere. Where did I draw lines? Here they are. Here are the lines, yeah. Y equals uh, fit draws, just taking the slope only and multiplying by the current level, right? Mm -hmm. uh, by the level coordinate. So I didn't, so what's weird about this is all these things just match at zero and they just fan out because I'm just only looking at the effect. I'm, I'm not, you know, not using the intercept, I'm not using anything else, right? And that's why they all fan out like that. Mm -hmm. And the point is like, if you then were to calculate the, expected effect for 0.1, what we do, you take 0.1 and multiply it by the slope, right? And I get that number right there, 0.125 or something like that, right? Um, and to get the error bar, I take the error bar and multiply it by the uh, 0.1 as well. So the error bars grow here because we, we, we fit a slope instead of fitting the, mm -hmm. um, fitting the uh, levels like this. That is to say, this one has a smaller error bar for 0.1 because we're using the information that this uh, bigger one had this bigger effect. So some, these, in other words, when you fit the slope, it's kind of combining together the data, assuming they're linear. That's what it, it's an inductive bias, right? We've been added right. an inductive bias by assuming they're linear. So it's no surprise that we get a lower error bar in this one, and a corresponding error bar, bigger error bar in this one. The advantage of fitting it by levels is if this was some kind of nonlinear effect or something, then you could easily uh, see that as well, right? That's what I got out of that. Yeah, what's your, I don't know what's your take on that. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm, 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 I, I think mine couldn't diverge from yours, just because I'm. I, 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 that's pretty dope. I, I mean, I've never done, seen like the mixture of that with like the the. This the the I always think of them as Tie Fighters or a, what do you call it, like the Star Wars fighters or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's pretty cool the way they're they're in there. Yeah. So was that the, was that the last one? That's yeah, that's the last one. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Oh, we're running out of time. Good. We're just in time. Uh, let yeah. me quickly talk about. Um, uh, let me go ahead and put the end in since I think this is the end. Where's the chat? I lost it. So that was kind of a fun exercise, I thought. 